welcome to the Mind Chimp Podcast. Hey Charlie, welcome to the Mind Chimp Podcast. How are we doing? I'm doing well. How are you? I am wonderfully well, my friend. I am wonderfully Great. well. Great. Have you done any work today? Well, not really. I've done a bit. I've done a bit. You know, it's kind of do the do the kind of hour work what you can be the most productive on, and then hopefully you get a lot of things ticked off your list. How about you? Yeah, I, uh, yeah, push some paper around. You know, you know how it is. This is Make it. sure my little my little Skype man is is green so people think I'm working. Yep, yep. Every is it every when does it turn from green to from active available to I kind think of when you're active, right? So um, yeah, you have to the the game is to keep it green because if it goes off green, then people know that you're just uh, I don't know. I like it. I like your style there, Charlie. Um, so I guess for for the podcast listeners, I, I know exactly who you are. You know, we speak. Um, so if this does come across quite friendly, because me and Charlie are actually friends in real life. Um, but I guess, Charlie, first thing I tend to do is I tend to ask my guests to pick five numbers from one to a hundred. Okay. Go for it. Uh, all right. Uh, one. Yep. Two. Okay. Ninety-seven. 97 98 98 50 and 50 perfect we will come back to them later on down the line for sure um right so Charlie, i guess when i get when i get my friends at a podcast on i tend to ask them yeah. to summarize yourself um as a log line or a tagline can you remember what yours was no i cannot <laughs> <laughs> i sent it to you though right so can i uh can i google it yeah. Oh, I'll click. I'll look it up again. Yeah, go for it. Go for it. This is this is uh, live. My it's live. Mine changes from week to week, frankly. So um let's see what's going on. Uh no, I didn't send you one. No. Um no, I did not. Okay. Uh my log line. I like this actually. Just what what summarizes you right now? If I say to you Give me, give me a sentence. What summarizes you as you are right this second? How are you feeling today? Go for it. Today, um, I don't know if I could say anything particularly interesting. I guess, yeah, I guess I'm feeling quite pensive. I'm chairing, I'm chairing a conference on on Thursday, Friday this week, so uh, I've got my head in head in that game at the moment. But uh, yeah, I guess my I kind of go through various levels of existential crisis almost on a weekly basis where I think, what's the point? Why am I doing what I'm doing? Um, so so yeah, like, like I say, my 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 log line would change week, week by week. But I guess what my head's at, at the moment is that, frankly, I just work because I want to have fun. And the way I have fun is by getting pissed with my mates. So, you know, working for fun and getting pissed with your mates. Would that be one? I think that's probably one of the best ones, to be honest. I think that's definitely Great. one of the best ones. Yeah. Well, it's an honest one, I think. Yeah. I don't have I don't have kids yet, so I can say that. That's fine. Yeah. That's fine. I like the getting pissed with mates is a is, is a definite priority. <laughs> so Well, yeah. It's when, top three. Yeah, it's one it's up there. It's up there, definitely. What's when you was in school, Charlie, and the teacher said, Charlie, Charlie, what is it you want to be when you grow up? What was it you mm. what was it you'd say to him? Yeah, I wanted to be a marine biologist, actually. Um, I had a penchant for for sharks. Um, and I think the reason for that is that they're basically awesome monsters that actually exist. So I was always interested in like dinosaurs and stuff like that. But, um, you know, there's nothing more terrifying to me of the idea of being in, being in the open ocean and being sort of stalked and hunted and killed by a great white shark, especially when you watch videos of them coming out of the water. Like they drag, they drag these kind of cardboard cutouts of small seals behind the boat, and the grey white shark will emerge from the blackness below, below this cardboard cutout, and it will just kind of rip it in half as it sort of surfaces and does a backflip. It's like it's the most horrific and terrifying, you know, scenario that I can imagine, and for that reason, I think they're incredible creatures. So I wanted to study them. Um, but uh, my mum gave me the advice that I should study what I was good at um, or do what I was good at. And I was good at uh, English history and uh, psychology. So ended up doing that. And now I'm in HR. The so, good yeah. life. The good life, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that yeah, kind of leads me on. That, that kind <laughs> of leads me on cool. smoothly, actually. For marine biology, in fact, let's let's step let's take it back a bit. I'm going to give you some random words right now, and I want you to just to tell me what comes to mind when I say these words. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Digital learning. 
just for learning what comes to mind yeah. is fatigue <laughs> fatigue okay um mooks remember duke nukem oh yes that game what a game that was yeah you know what just his little like face it. just sprang to my mind <laughs> <laughs> you know what you think about some of the games now you know duke, duke nukem was it duke nick do duke nukem and duke nukem was it i want to say 3d or i can't remember I think it was duke nukem 3, yeah 3d yeah um it was one of the first games i one of the first 3d games i played i think and I, I seem to remember the the you kind of shoot stuff and it would kind of melt into like a green sludge. That's I don't what know. I... It, was, it was cool. And he used to wear he had like a vest, didn't he? Like a yellow vest on. Yeah. It was like a it was like a full on badass, wasn't it, really? Yeah. The, um, and sunny. <laughs> I, but I think about when you think about some of these games now though. Like Duke Nukem stands out. I think some of the other classic ones were Mario Kart. I was a I was a big fan of Mario Kart. Um um Golden Eye for the I think it was the N64 as well. That was a good game. Anyway, yeah. we kind of went off on a tangent, eh? You did a little bit. You did. Yeah, it's all good. Back um, on track. So, <laughs> so okay. Um, AR and VR. The future. Okay. Um, classroom. Uh, matrices. Okay, okay. And L&D. Uh, L and D. I don't know. I just, I just have no time for it, frankly. And I know that's going to come as a surprise for someone who works in L and D on an L and D podcast. But um, yeah, I just, I just think so much of it is complete nonsense. But <clears throat> yeah, hopefully we'll get an opportunity to justify my position on that. But we'll see. <laughs> oh yes, we will. Oh, don't you worry. Okay. I've got that mapped out already. Great. Um, so. I mean, yeah, maybe, maybe this is a good opportunity. You know, you know, I know you pretty well, um, but maybe mm. some of our some of our guests don't know who you are. So maybe if you could give yeah. us a bit of a, a whistle stop tour of kind of kind of who you are, where you've come from, and where you are right now would be great. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think one of the one of the most important things to um, to kind of set uh set the boundaries for up front is that although i might come come across as kind of a a bit of a twat i think actually i would say mostly people when they work with me realize that i do i am trying to do the right thing and that i'm not one um but it is i think it is worth saying that <clears throat> that i come across come kind of can come across quite provocative and um childish and uh i think in some ways i am but also uh i am generally trying to do the right thing and um uh, and kind of help people which is really what 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 i'm trying to do in my in my work so that's probably an important piece of context um but i oh god do you need to know my career or is that boring that's no boring. let's do it let's do it you want to do my career? Uh, okay so um i've moved career i moved jobs sorry once every th three uh three years or less um and the reason for that is i feel like after about two years and i understand how the game is played within any business i get bored and i move on somewhere else where there's a new game and a new challenge or new new people to kind of understand because i think every culture becomes a bit like a um well you you become assimilated from in a, into a company culture and once you're assimilated it's very difficult to have pers perspective and awareness on um who you are and what you're doing uh, and that sort of thing so um i've moved from uh a because uh, experiential marketing to BP to PA consulting, I had a short time at Freeformers, um, and then I'm now at Performance Consultants, which is a a company that basically does culture change through the application of coaching. Um, so that's that's my kind of thread. Okay, okay, that was a that was a good whistle stop tour, to be honest. So I actually want to know a little bit more about kind of where you are right now. So you know, I don't. I don't Considering we're friends, I don't really know too much about where you actually are. Um, like physically where I am? No, not physically where you are. I can see <laughs> you. In your no, um, kind of like, yeah, you know, professionally, where, where kind of performance consulting, but how how did this come across? Kind of what, what's the kind of cool stuff they're up to or you're up to? Um, I think I'm, frankly, the, the cool stuff I'm working on is mainly ideas. Um, I'm doing some, I'm basically working on a digital product uh, to support 
the flagship program that this company offers, um, Performance Consultants offers, which is called Coaching for Performance, which is based on the original, really the original business coaching book by a guy called Sir John Whitmore. So um, it's it's been running for like 30 years um, and this coaching program has been refined to more or less perfection and we get NPS scores of 100 and stuff like that. Um, but what, you know, before I joined, what hasn't been done really is is thinking about the scalability of that program and the, you know, the core skills related to coaching um, and performance. So what I'm working on is ways to, ways to scale. Um, what I'm super interested in, if I'm honest, is AI because, um, I worked with Nick Shackleton Jones at BP and PA Consulting, and and at the time, both at BP and PA, we were building uh, responsive websites, you know, and it's the stuff that you see on like Loop and other, um, you know, other kind of platforms which build themselves as kind of learning experience platforms instead of learning management systems. But in any case, the 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 challenge I think is that. <clears throat> it's not habitual for people to use these platforms. So whether you build a really nice looking platform with some great content on it, it's not habitual for people to go and access the content. So what really needs to happen is that there's a system in which the content is proactively pushed towards the end user, which is where the AI system comes in. So what I'm, what I'm interested in really is whether you can nudge people in the right direction to kind of become better leaders um, by applying coaching skills. So that's really what I'm about at the moment. Oh, nice. Okay. So, I mean, one of the interesting things which I find, and I, I want to touch upon the thing which you mentioned earlier, the the conference which you've got coming up as well. Um, yeah. But what I find interesting is your kind of career paths, one which I think a lot of people in L&D go the opposite way. So, like, for me personally, I was, a while back, I was looking at how do I get back, how do I get into experiential marketing? Because for me, that's where I can be this creative ideator and, and come up with these ideas and understand people better but you've kind of gone from that into where you are now so i mean what skill set yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah that's cool that? That? why yeah 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 no that's fair so um one thing that i what i recognized working in marketing was that you you kind of realize how pointless um capitalism is so you're basically working for big clients you have lots of money pumping money into marketing um, and basically what you're selling is oil and gas or you know um shit that people don't need and it becomes very sort of soulless as an existence um and i'd say the other person that's done the same move as me is Gemma critchley who used to work at um, first direct and other companies like that doing digital marketing so um i had a i had a, a go at the marketing stuff and although i'm I'm very kind of envious of the life, frankly, that my wife has, you know, being taken out by these great companies, um, all these amazing awards do that she goes to. And um, actually, <clears throat> I find I find the, pur- the purpose of what I'm doing is more important than, than all that kind of fun stuff. So I want to feel like I'm making a difference. Um, and you don't get that so much in marketing unless you're working for a company that you believe in the mission of. Um, and actually, as an a- in an agency world, you don't get that. You don't get that option. So usually you work for whoever you're told to work for. So that's kind of why I think I don't still work in marketing and, and moved away from it. And there's also probably something around the fact that I was pretty crap at it. So um, I was, it was, it was my first job really out of, out of uni. And um, I had a manager who was, uh, let's say she had high standards and I was quite inexperienced. So she basically crushed my spirit, made me hate myself. And, uh, and as soon as Nick came along with the offer to come and work, go and work for BP and, um, and pay me three times as much. I was like, "Yep, I think I'll take that offer." <laughs> <laughs> so that's the uh, that's the story. <clears throat> you know what? Though I think I think it's interesting that you mentioned about kind of being able to get behind the mission, if you like. Um, especially like you say with consultants. You know, when you're working with different different clients, so many different clients. I think you find yourself quite a lot going. I don't even agree with what's going on here, and and actually what we're telling our cli- our customers isn't even the right thing for them. I mean, this is probably a question which I haven't even prepped for, but d- did you find that, in, have you found that in previous employees that you kind of end up selling something which probably wouldn't be the best for them? Or maybe it's just a case of you just haven't been given enough time to really understand it. I think that's the case with most most um, consultants, really. Um, but... Well, I think with consultancy, at least you feel like you can help them because you're, you know, you're a body on the ground. 
you ha you know you have a perspective on what can be done to make stuff better oftentimes the limiting factor is money so um if you know i'd go into a company i'd design a kind of end-to-end -end experience design with some digital stuff which i think would make a difference and then they say well we can only afford to do this classroom bit so you end up doing the classroom um and it's not it doesn't have the impact that you'd like but it's still better than what they would have done if they'd gone elsewhere so there's that um there's that kind of perspective on it i think but yeah i think unless you own your own business and you, unless you you know um you have you have the power to make those kind of decisions and frankly you don't you're not living on the bread line and you don't have to take those jobs yeah you do always end up working for people you don't really want to work for but that's you know that's the safety of working for a company i suppose instead of for yourself yeah i think i think i found something recently well i say recently probably my last client where they came to us and it was like we need xyz and um basically what they needed was a community that's literally what they needed they thought we needed an lms or we needed this i'm like no you don't need that you just need a better way of collaborating and communicating with each other and um and and when I was on this Skype call with him, I was like, I see you using Slack. You're asking us to build the equivalent of Slack when you're already using it. I was like, why are you asking us to build something when you're already using it? Oh, our business won't sign off on Slack. I'm like, wow. So your users, the people, have already figured around the patch to get around their frustration. And now the business will go come in and go, let's ignore everything what our people have figured out for themselves. And let's give them something what we think we want rather than what we do want. Mm. well yeah I, I can't imagine i don't know what company you're talking about but i imagine it's fairly hierarchical culture is dependent so people just do what they're told and usually the only way to get around that is frankly to go and speak to the boss um and say look boss this is what's going on will you help me sign it off it's all political bullshit and actually that's why i've i've gone from i don't know if you noticed and there was also a trajectory in my career where was, at one point i kind of peaked at size at bp and then went down to pa which is smaller than that and then went down to performance consultants which is um well we've got an associate a global associate group of a big you know it's a big company in that sense but because they're associates they're not um you know they're not directly employed so actually the core team's only 12 but um it, it, that kind of culture <clears throat> that kind of corporate culture where it's, it's constantly political and you know backstabbing and um and kind of this whole veneer of um civilization where everyone's being passive aggressive <laughs> just just binds my gears to be honest so i got out of that it's just a waste of time and energy i think you know it, is. it makes people anxious as well it make pe people people are stressed the reason mindfulness and, and meditation is becoming so popular is because people spend half their time stressed and anxious by by subtext and it's ironic um and uh yeah it's it's just sad to see people when they're in that kind of that kind of cage their mental cage <clears throat> so um so i'd say if you're if you feel like you're in that mental cage maybe get out do something else it's, a, it's an interesting one i think i was having this conversation with bridge the other day actually and i was like you know when you see all these companies putting in their values and behaviors and like fundamentally the values and behaviors what they're putting in place is we we get so far in this in this culture environment that we have to put filters over every single thing we say and then by the end by the time you put x amount of filters over what you're saying it's fundamentally twisting your words to not be what the, what they intended to be originally and it gets you so rattled up and tightened inside that that's where, like you say, the mind, this mindfulness and this mental well-being is becoming higher because we, we're told we've got to put so many filters on this this thing, what we want to say. Why can I not turn around and say, well, actually, what you've just done there is a dick move? And and maybe I'm being maybe I'm being a bit over the top, but you explain to me why it's not a dick move. Like, it's, it's just, I don't yeah. know. Well, I spend half, you know, as, as a Brit, I spend, you know, a huge amount percentage of my time trying to suppress other f emotions that I don't need. I don't need to spend my whole time also suppressing my speech <laughs> at work as well. So, I mean, I, I, I've, I guess I've always been known slightly as, uh, as slightly abrasive or provocative because actually I don't filter what I say in many time, many in many cases. I know how to play the game. If I'm going to meet a new client, you know, I'll put on a show, I'll shake hands, I'll smile, I'll laugh at their jokes. Um, but when it comes down to actually day to day working with with a client they'll, they'll quickly learn that I tend to be fairly authentic and just say what I mean or say what I think and actually generally that's and that there's obviously outliers of people that disagree with this but generally that's worked quite well for me in the sense that you know I have managed to be more or less be true to what I 
believe and whether or not that's right or wrong generally speaking clients have, have kind of um have liked that approach so but actually i also think it may have may have something to do with the fact that i'm kind of blonde haired blue eyed white middle class bloke if i was you know i'm also in a very uh, a very fortunate demographic in where where i say what i mean and people don't you know think i'm a complete tit although many people do so uh so something to be <laughs> aware of. i think it's, it's interesting though. i think um it is refreshing to hear that. I, I've always, I've said it loads of times. I'd rather me think somebody's a dick for them being authentic and be, and knowing where you stand with them. Give me give me someone who I know where I stand with them and they won't go around bitching behind my back or this and that. I will take that any day over this kind of face to face. You know, like you say veneer of oh yeah we're friends, but behind closed doors they're trying to one up you or whatever else. So I think. You know, yeah, I, I get where you're coming from with it. You know, I think it's always best to be authentic, at least as long as you can sleep at night. You know, that's the most important thing that you've been true to you and, and, and what you're about, I guess. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm certainly not um, a Buddhist, but uh, I did some reading around Buddhism because this, there was certainly something that um, attracted to me, attracted me to this idea that um, that desire is the source of all unhappiness, and actually having done a bit of reading around it and understood sort of some of the central philosophy around it, I think the the idea that you can only be happy if you're happy with what's going on inside is definitely something that I, I buy into. So actually the, what that does is release you from this constant need to be um, validated by other people or validated by what you own and things like that. So um, that's kind of core to the way I think about <clears throat> how I operate in, in business in the sense that I'm not constantly chasing. Um, I don't feel like I'm constantly chasing the, um, uh, you know, the, the, the kind of external, the external next, game. The next the big thing, the next, yeah. the next new iPhone, the next this, the next that. Yeah, exactly. So I mean, I'm wearing Ted Baker shoes that I've owned for about four years. Um, I managed to buy some new ones last week, which still haven't arrived, but they were £32 on a second, you know, a secondhand site, and that's fine by me. They do the job of the shoe. So, <laughs> <laughs> but that said, that said, I do want to, you know, I, I, that said, there's also a limit to how much, you know, I want to earn good money and I want to, you know, have have freedom to, you know, drink lots of booze with my pals at music festivals and, you know, go on nice holidays with my wife and other stuff. So, I think, um, Joe Rogan nails this. He likes having fuck it money. Like, I like the idea of that. Like, just having enough money so that you can just go and try things and experiment with stuff and just actually, you know what, it's money what I can I can not blow, but it's where I don't have to worry about it. Oh, I can't afford to do that idea what I want to do because if it goes wrong, then I can't pay for my mortgage. I like the idea of that, but obviously I'm far, far away from Joe Rogan. I think Joe Rogan has probably got so much money he's, he doesn't know what to do with himself. But, um, yeah. I mean, there is something about, I always share this anecdote. I always used to, when I, certainly when I was working in marketing and getting paid, fuck all, basically, um, you know, I'd always, I always used to buy the cheapest sandwich in Sainsbury's. Like, you know, when you go to the Sainsbury's and you've got like a whole range of different ones, they do like the super, super nice ones, which are like, I don't know, three quid. Then you've got like medium ones, which are like 250. And then you've got the shit ones, which are like, I don't know, a pound 20. And I always used to buy the pound 20 ones because I'd always be, you know, pinching pennies basically. And sure, I could have stopped drinking uh, or done something, you know, to, to kind of cur curtail my spending. But at the same time, I got to a point where I, when I was earning enough to like, um, you know, buy, buy the three pound sandwich, that was a big deal for me because <laughs> yeah. I could go to the shop and be like, you know what, I don't have to worry about buying a three pound sandwich. I can, <laughs> you know, I can, I can live with that. And that's, even that day to day makes me feel good about you know the money that I'm earning, and it's not you know tons, but it's enough to to feel comfortable. So yeah, and and I guess yeah, let me just kind of justify that, just building on that. So I've only recently got into a job where I kind of I'm very similar to what you just mentioned there, kind of you know being able to buy a three pound fifty sandwich, um, and it is like like I don't want any. It's weird to say I don't want any more money than what I've got, but right now. Like I'm not chasing an extra ten grand or an extra fifteen grand. I'm, I'm, I'm I like being content. I don't, I don't want because I think with more money, like you know, like um, 
um, P. Diddy says, more money, more problems. And I think um, that's kind of what I think. I think you, you once you start clawing for that money and kind of you, you do get more stress and more pressure. And then at some point you've got to go, actually, is that money really worth this value in life? What disappears due to it? Yeah, I think it's weird, though, because I had a conversation with my mother-in-law. You know, I have conversations with the mother-in-law and you're like, I completely disagree with what you're saying. But because you're my mother-in-law, I have to kind of humor you. So I had this mm. one of these conversations. I hope she's not listening to this. I have one of these conversations <laughs> on Saturday where she was like, I just don't get it. Like, we've got this doctor who um, who works works for us and he just doesn't want to work full time. He wants to go home at 5.30 every day and he wants to work three days a week. And, you know, he talks about this work-life balance thing. Um, and we're like, and, and and I'm like, well, you know, you should work, work long hours because then you get the experience, make you a better doctor. But for me that, you know, that there was no, there was nothing wrong at all with that doctor saying, you know, I want to work three days a week because work-life balance is important. And what he's decided is it's more important to spend time with his new family than it is to, you know, become the best doctor he can ever be. Um, he's obviously not ambitious to be, you know, to be a partner or whatever it is. So that's a legitimate position on 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 the on the value of work for him but i think people of a slightly older generation have a very different perspective on it which is that you know frankly um in many cases you know people felt, felt almost well they they were certainly um what's the word i'm looking for <clears throat> they were great very grateful to have the job that they had and they would stay in that job for as long as they could keep that job um and i think oh i I don't know what your view is, but my perspective is slightly different, which is that um, I'm a commodity to a business. And if I'm confident enough in my own skills and I'm progressive and ambitious enough in, in developing my own skills, then actually I become the asset that the that the company needs. So they should be coming to me and they should be grateful to have me. Now that's a very different, you know, a different view in the world of the talent war than it was in my parents' generation who were kind of much more... Um, uh, conservative about you know when they moved jobs and, and and all that kind of stuff so I know it's the same for everyone but I think that's certainly true for me and, and my friends and stuff and yeah I'm the exact same child so I think um I remember when I walked out of a, a job um probably after about a week and my mom was like oh my god you, you know you can't you can't be walking out of a job I'm like why my skill set is good enough I know for a fact I'm going to find another job. And then I, it is that mindset. And it, I think if you don't explain it, it can seem a bit eager. But I'm with you on that. It kind of, you you are the asset, you know. Businesses are lucky to get people who have the skill sets, what we have. So, and we're, don't get me wrong, we're not hit men or anything. But it's like, it's it's like, um we do have we do have a skill set which is, is quite organic. It can move, it can go, you know, it can be different things in different areas. But I think when you look at kind of, you know, but the older generation, their skill set was very task, do task, task, task. And they probably, you know, they didn't have that. And that's probably where it came. They had to be in that job for the rest of their lives. Um, but I am with you on that kind of, it is that mindset of, if I walk out of this job tomorrow, ideally, I've got a skill set and the knowledge and past projects to kind of walk into the next one. And they are lucky to have me as much as I am to them. Yeah. I think interviews are as much about interviewing a company as is you know, you being interviewed. So, um, so yeah, I think it's a, it's a changing mindset and, you know, people talk about the gig economy and stuff like that. Um, and it's, it's, it's a mindset more than, you know, more than a, um, more than a structure, I think. So, um, I think the mindset that people have nowadays is they want to just do lots of different projects and actually the network that we have now, um, is kind of is is how those how that gig economy works in the sense that you know the network is a group of people that I trust that you trust that if I had a job and I needed some work doing around L and D consultancy I would get them in and they would help you know deliver the project and I trust them implicitly to do that so that's you know these little pools and communities that you're certainly active in setting up you know is is kind of real realizing this reality of um, you know, that allows people to move fluidly between companies and actually for big companies that are kind of built and recruitment processes that are built around retaining talent for two, three, five, six, whatever long years, that's actually becoming more, more unrealistic. Um, so, yeah. I think, I think it becomes unrealistic and actually it becomes a risk 
because the yeah. last thing I want to do is keep people in my business for six years if they're, if they're becoming stalemate. They just can't be bothered. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, like you know, disappear. I think I think it's Zappos who who offer their their people if you want to leave, we'll give you ten grand if you want to leave. I just think that you know it's good that they want to stay, but you know it's this whole thing of this values and behaviors again. Like, why do I want loads of people to come into my business who all have the same values and behaviors? Where does the inclusive and new ideas of diversity come into it it kind of becomes its own blocker i think somewhere down the line mm. well it becomes it's it's actually less that they have the values because i think the values are so kind of generic that everyone would say yeah i kind of the value of respect is something that chimes with me i don't you know you don't employ people who who don't value respect as a value but it's more like it's more about the fact that you're not allowed to talk about it <laughs> so you're not allowed to challenge the value or challenge the way that they're worded um and it becomes a kind of a uh you know command and control um you know template basically which is like these are our values if you don't subscribe to these values and you say well you know the, the value of courage i'm not sure whether that works for me i prefer something like bravery as a word because that's you know i believe in kind of taking you know taking risks in this way or something like that and it's like well oh, no that's not our value our value is courage <laughs> So, um, so it's a way. It's a way of commanding and controlling, um, and and kind of create, as you say, creating a, a standard, standardizing the way people think about the work that they're doing in in a particular company. Um, in my view, but I'm you know I'm probably wrong, and there's probably plenty of people who disagree. But I think it's good to be wrong, so it's fine. It's it's all good. I think it is that it's that there's so much nuance between the value and how I perceive it to how you perceive it anyway. So it becomes this pointless task anyway. Um, but actually, kind of, I want to jump back into your your tagline. So, kind of, getting pissed, having fun, and um, no, it was working for fun and getting pissed with your mates. So break this down, break it down to me, Charlie. Like, we, we we've kind of semi already touched upon it in a way, but yeah, you know, this kind of is it. You know, I think, like you mentioned, your marriage and stuff, and kind of, I've seen it with past friends. They get married and kind of. They, dis- they disappear, um, and you, you've probably seen once every blue moon. But I take it kind of friendship and having that kind of, you know, staying with them friends throughout is, is, is massively important to you, I take it. It isn't, it isn't. Um, I've actually, uh, what I would say is that <clears throat> I didn't, you know, it wasn't like I've had friends all my life that I've stayed in touch with. So certainly at school and stuff, um, I've only really retained sort of one or two friends from that time. I d- didn't enjoy school. Um, I, f- I was constantly anxious and stressed or wanted to be cool. Um, didn't understand what that meant, all this kind of stuff. So, um, so yeah, so, so I wouldn't say it's that it's more about, um, uh, I think when you're having fun with people, it's the, it's the only time you really get to see them, you know, with their guard down and actually, and, you know, potentially be vulnerable or whatever. And actually just, you know, when people are having fun, I think, that's when their personalities, you know, really blossom, and and you get to you get to enjoy people's company more. And um, I think the more people are the more people are uh, expect work to be a certain way and to be in a kind of corporate robot um, mode. I think the less the less you really see the real person. So I guess that's why fun is so important to me. And um, and actually, although I'm not constantly having it, <laughs> you know, all the time at work or even at home. I really just value. I really value the opportunities to to have fun with people. Um, yeah, and getting pissed with my mates. I guess it's another example of, of how of of where you where you're seeing people's people without their filters on. So um, you know, <clears throat> totally respect people who don't drink. I've many times I've had hangovers and wish I didn't. Um, but at the same time, there's something about um, you know going to the pub letting you know letting off some steam losing some inhibitions um you know and again it's about being yourself and being you know being who you are and not not having filters so so i guess there is a there is a kind of a relevant L D theme running up running through it which is and i can't remember who it was i think it might have been um david james from loop posted something about um uh, i can't remember what relation it was to to, to L and fun but I said, you know, at the end of the day, if there was a, 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 a department in charge of fun in many big companies, and that was their their role, they probably had a big, they probably have a bigger impact than L and D in many cases, because we're talking about engagement. And actually, um, 
allowing people to be themselves and have fun is I think a really important part of work. Um, and I know that's, that's not necessarily a, a view held by everybody, but I think more and more for people my age, it is. Um, so yeah, watch this space, Department of Fun coming, coming soon. So I think that's a cracking idea. And I was kind of lucky to manage said team um, years ago in my career. It was at a call center. Um, and it was, it was that. The, the department where you had the fun department, this was called the tag department. Um, and it was about, it was fundamentally about that. Kind of how can we make fun work, how can we make work fun? Because, you know, fundamentally these people are on call centers, nine till five, dealing yeah. with customers. Where, you know, how can we kind of have fun? And it was, they ended up becoming the voice which had more stay than most of the managers. You know, yeah. you end up having this pull because you had this advisor back in and it was like, they actually generally care about us rather than this fake kind of cover of us, you know. But I think it's a it's a it's a great shout. So yeah, but there, there is a huge. I mean, there are people in in businesses that fear fun because um, it's not a it's not a it's not a process. Um, <laughs> so I won't name names, but someone quite close to us was trying to sort of psychoanalyze. Um, not psychoanalyzed, but we was was trying to understand the, <laughs> the formula that made the a particular event that we attended recently um, a fun event. Um, and uh, and and for me, for me, it's as much about just sort of having fun yourself and role modeling that enjoyment experience and and lack of filters. Um, and but for people who who kind of theorize about stuff, it can be very difficult to kind of live in the moment. So maybe it's something that uh, the extroverts <laughs> particularly um, particularly like that kind of fluidity. But actually, um, I've seen lots of introverts have fun as well. So I don't think it that's necessarily a fair yeah. uh, fair assumption. But it's, um, it's a good shout. But yeah, man. it's a good shout. I think just going back to. When we went out, it was for the mindship meetup. When we went out afterwards, like yeah, we went out. We got and, hammered. Yeah, we got spanned. <laughs> like setting the bar on fire and stuff like that. And I just think that's fundamentally you, you you wouldn't get to see that in a lot of, you know, I don't think the opportunity is there for that. You know, when you look at say corporate environments and stuff like that, you know, how even when you go out on a team night out, and I'm doing bunny ears, nobody can see me. But even when you go on a team night out, there's still a limitation to kind of. I think they still have it going on in the back of the mind to a point. Yeah, and then the, the other thing about it is there's no hierarchy at a party. So, so you go you go out with your you go out with a boss, and yeah, your boss. And I, I don't get me wrong, I completely understand why your boss isn't the drunkest person at the party. They need to maintain this kind of this this veneer of leadership which i completely i completely get that um and actually that's why you don't invite your boss to your parties but um <laughs> but <clears throat> there is something about um yeah there is something about that in terms of even a, even an office party can be can be quite stilted and everyone's still got their mask on um i also i would also probably caveat to this to say i feel like most people like most of what people do and i'm doing this to, to some extent now is just try to is try to reproduce or create the thing that they that suits them perfectly so the the kind of world i'm describing is just the world that i would want to live in and i'm sure that's a world that most other people wouldn't um so i'm just going to recognize that and uh um and say let's try it <laughs> see what happens that's the worst that can happen so I kind of want to, um, you know, we kind of talked about events, got hammered, and then we, we mentioned the event which you're kind of prepping for now. Is it this week? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, if you've got time, Charlie, yeah, I'd love to know a little bit about what that actually is. I think we spoke about it briefly at Nick's book launch and then kind of we had to get yeah. busy and stuff, but yeah. Yeah, so it's called the Corporate Learnings L&D. Sorry, let me start again. It's called the Fourth Annual Corporate L&D Summit. So it's a really catchy catchy title um but it's funny i i originally stood in for nick uh shackleton jones at a conference a conference that this company ran called the future workplaces event so i turned up with my L D slides looking to talk about the future you know the future of work and stuff like that um and uh, it turned out it was lit the literal future workplaces event so everybody there was an architect <laughs> and had absolutely no interest or understanding about L D. but fortunately i was the last speaker on the last day 
and everyone was fed up about talking about buildings. So actually my talk went down very well. And, uh, and then I was invited to chair this conference, but it was the first annual corporate L&D summit. Um, and now we're on the fourth. So um, I basically chaired it every year and every year they flown me out to, you know, an exotic part of Europe, like Lisbon a couple of years ago, Barcelona again last year, this year it's in Barcelona again. Um, and it's kind of gone from strength to strength in a way. And I've had, you know, I've been, had the opportunity to in some ways shape it. Um, I think when you're chairing a conference, you're, uh, you're kind of a, an, you're basically the source of energy for, for the conference. Um, and although I can be quite dour and, and low energy a lot of the time, actually when I'm in kind of acting mode, I can be quite energetic and fun. So um, basically I, I bring the party to the, <laughs> to the event and um, yeah, and it's good. There'll be lots of kind of senior, you know, LD folk specialists there and my boss is coming over to do a talk about coaching culture and large organizations. Um, so yeah, that's what it is. That's what I'll be doing. Cool. I think there is a need for, um, I know I think we, we've spoke about this in the past and kind of this is where I think the Mindship events kind of idea come from, from a while ago and you're doing this. I think there's a need for a new, you know, and we have spoke about this, but a need for a new L and D event, and and I don't even think it needs to be L and D. There's a need for an immersive event. There is a need for it, I think. Oh, but I don't know if there's a need for it or just because I want to do it. Well, this is it. It's coming back to my point earlier about people just basically want to do what they want to do, <laughs> and some people go along with it. I would say, yeah. I mean, I agree. I think. Um, I mean, whenever I speak to anyone in L&D outside of the actual events, people just basically say, oh, these events are so boring. Why do I keep going? And the reason you go is because you have, you know, networks that you want to see. Um, so what I'm, what I'm more interested in is basically just saying, right, how can we have a lot of fun um, and have the people there that you want to chat to? Um, and, uh, and it's, you know, it doesn't have to be a, a conference. Um, you know, conferences are generally quite boring. Um, so what I prefer to do is basically just to piss up with some, you know, something interesting going on. Um, we had the we had the book launch, next book launch the other week. I'm thinking of doing something a similar kind of event this time with the, around the theme of magic. So I might get some magicians in who can teach us a few tricks um, and uh, and talk about magic and kind of some of the some of the principles of it. And then <clears throat> the rest of the time it will just be us kind of having a good time, drinking too much beer and you know, we'll end up in the kebab shop again, you know? So, um, so that's the, you know, so, so yeah, but I think there's, there's always going to be a place for, for people who, you know, want to operate within, within the confines of a, you know, corporate style organized conference where they know how to play the game and they know what to say at what point. And, um, and it's generally people that struggle with, uh, you know, the, the, the fluidity of, of kind of a social party type environment yeah safer and secure yeah which is fine and you know there's again respect to those people you need people that that want to do that um but i'm not one of those people yeah okay cool well i want to get a i want to get kind of a little bit more about kind of these questions can be they can be buzz questions they can be yeah. fire around it can be as deep as you want to get with them really Charlie. but we all have this cv the cv where we're like this is me this is everything i've done i'm so good so good here, Mr. Employee, take me on. But actually, I think, you know, when it comes to better interviews, you know, it would be best if the, if the interviewer turned around and said, actually, show me your failure resume or failure <laughs> CV. Um, oh, I've got so many. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, I guess just building on that, kind of what's what would be the two biggest things? What would be the two, and I'm going to say this really good, I say really good, what's your two positive failures on what would be on your failure resume? Ah, oh, best failures. Um, my first, my first best failure, I think, was I was a BP. It was probably the first week I was there. I was basically hired to do a role. I had no idea what I was doing. So I was hired as I was, and people at BP won't be surprised by this. Um, I was hired as a community engagement manager, which was quite forward thinking um, at the time because it was basically about how I could build social learning communities. Um, and obviously I had some some marketing background, but it was you know basically event marketing. I don't know whether or not Nick knew the difference, to be honest. But in any case, um, I did some social media stuff uh, and uh, I did a presentation 
to the toll team, a team of people like Revan Bath and Morton Bond, um, Babs, uh, Barbara Thompson as uh, Babs. And, um, and it was just dog shit, rubbish presentation and just pr showed everybody that I knew nothing about the subject that I'd been hard or the thing I'd been hard to do. So I kind of like started out um as you do and uh nick took me aside afterwards and was like and took me into a room and was like so how do you think that went classic coaching question and uh and i was like yeah don't worry i understand i've you know i felt the vibes i knew exactly what happened there um and so nick was like yep so um so here are some things here are three things you can do that are going to help you um <laughs> the uh in this role number one is reading books <laughs> 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 and uh and yeah i took his advice i read some books and then i slowly began to sound like i knew what i was talking about um and yeah i still read <laughs> books today so it's uh you know and, and actually <clears throat> a lot of the stuff that i learned through nick at bp um you know actually the the books that nick would have read like the design of everyday everyday things um, and books around design thinking and stuff gave birth to some of the models like the 5DI model, which is basically design thinking, but applied to L&D. Um, and I reckon, you know, given enough time and given enough uh, reading, I could have probably come up with the same idea. So what I'm, what, what I kind of learned from that experience really is that, yeah, books are important. Um, they're not great performance support, but what they do do is, is kind of stimulate thinking and reflection and you can come up with new ideas and, and connect different ideas from different books. So um, that was a good failure. I enjoyed that that failure. Um, <clears throat> second failure, uh, probably a recent one actually. So um, I came to came to this company and uh, uh, I. <clears throat> I basically sort of ran around trying to fix stuff as quickly as possible. One of the things I tried to fix as quickly as possible was the website. Um, and, uh, and I was basically, it was making me anxious. The fact that the website was looking a bit outdated and needed some upgrading. So I, I moved as quickly as possible to implement a new design and build of a new website from scratch in three months. Um, and, uh, was it, was it two months in any case too quickly? Um, we used we used a tool, a, a well-known tool, um, which later we discovered um, kind of let us down. But in any case, we we kind of dropped in the SEO rankings, which was our kind of main um, source of inquiry, by about I don't know thirty percent, twenty percent, thirty percent. And I think that had a, an adverse effect on the on the business and the pipe, pipe business pipeline. And that actually is certainly not ideal for a company of this size. So. Um, yeah, so that was a, a kind of a failure which had a direct impact on, you know, on the business. And uh, I had to kind of suck it up and eat some humble pie and recognize that I, uh, I'd i kind of moved too quickly. I'd kind of railroaded a lot of um, a lot of other people's views in, the, in that process. And uh, it was a kind of useful reminder for me to not be a, a tit, as I described earlier. So, yeah, that's a, a more recent one. <clears throat> okay. Okay, and uh, I guess maybe just flipping this on its head. So, what's been your your most recent personal success? Good question. Like, I I I know you. I know which one I think it is, but obviously, I want you. To yeah, see. I mean, per if I'm honest, personally, I would say that I um I had a boxing match last year. Uh, as my first boxing match um and did it for charity it was eight weeks of training um and then um and then a fight at the end a white collar fight so you have you're wearing quite paddy gloves with a helmet and stuff but uh it was in front of a crowd of probably i don't know 500 people at the troxy in east london um never had a fight in my entire life so you can imagine <clears throat> what i felt like going on to going into the stepping into the ring um but uh but yeah i loved it i won um i learned a huge about about myself and i also kind of um o overcame a kind of concern or not concern but i overcame a kind of assumption that i was a bit of a coward and i would have shied away from a fight but uh you know actually it kind of worked out it worked out good um and uh it worked out good that's not good english is it oh god i'm never gonna live that one down um it worked out well <laughs> and uh and uh yeah i learned i learned a lot from it but i, I guess there's um 
what what I also found interesting about that that process is when you see like boxes and stuff giving it the big one and sort of saying oh I'm going to knock him out and all this kind of stuff I always assumed it was just a kind of show but um actually what I discovered was it's as much about their own psychology and how they think about you know going into those kind of in you know situations and it's as much about their own ability to overcome the fear and the anxiety as it is about the other person so um so when if, if a friend would ask me you know a week before so how you know you feeling confident how's it going to go i'd be like yeah i'm gonna fucking knock him out <laughs> and i'm not an aggressive person i would never usually talk like that but in that scenario in that scenario when you've got something you know as serious as a fight planned in your diary your your psychology is to to block out any kind of anxiety or, or 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 doubt so doubt is doubt is your enemy in that scenario and that's actually something that i learned um about bravado in particularly in boxing but in other sports and that for me it was quite an interesting insight mixed martial arts i've done mixed martial arts probably before the ufc became massive as it is now um and you know i know a couple of probably yeah pro pro um I don't want to use the word cage fighter, but let's just use it anyway. Um, and it's it's interesting how many of them actually have kind of mental coaches. Um, yeah. You know, someone like Conor McGregor, he has a mental warfare coach. I'm not sure if you know of that. So he has sort yeah. of just a coach on how to... So you know when you see Conor McGregor at these, you know, press conferences, it's all about belittling yeah. him and, and destroying them personally and whatever. Yeah. Conor McGregor has an actual personal coach who will teach him how to do that. Yeah, yeah, that doesn't surprise me at all. I mean, it, it seems crazy to me that not that every sportsman doesn't have a coach, because it's as much. I mean, I'm not bringing it right back into the depth of of L and D and coaching, but the whole the whole basis of the work that I do at this business, I'm you know, performance consultants, is that it's based on a book called The Inner Game by a guy called Tim Galway, who's it's basically a psychology book about how you overcome the the, the kind of opponent in your own head, and so you know you see it every day in football and rugby and cricket whatever it is you know the collapse you know the typical england collapse or you know the the comeback kid and all these kind of you know stories the great stories you get from through different sports are are all down to you know psychology and the the idea that the very thoughts that people wouldn't train their minds as they train their bodies to me sounds it just seems incredibly naive um so yeah i think everybody if they don't already if you're a sportsman listening to this and you don't already have a sports coach for your mind then uh sort your shit out and get one and then then the second question would be why you listen to an rd podcast sportsman <laughs> yeah 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 stick with, where you, stick with what you're good at <laughs> no you don't want to be here you want to be doing sport um 100%, 100%. No. okay so if you was to give a gift to five people of a book what book would you give and why? I would give them How People Learn by Nick Shackleton Jones. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Boom. No, in all seriousness, it is a great book. Um, and uh, I would give it as a gift because it's new. But also it's uh, it's dr- story driven, so it's not boring. There's some really good embarrassing stories in which amuse me because it's Nick. And also um, I think it's, yeah, I think it just completely revolutionizes the way people think about you know the brain language and emotion and i think that's uh it's very important that you give it a read so you can give me the cash afterwards okay nick. i'll put um an amazon link in there so then you can click through that and i'll make some money off nick's book that'd be great um so this is my favorite question really one of my favorite ones but the billboard question you know you've got a billboard and a million people are going to leave the stadium and are going to see that billboard what is it you'd put on that billboard? Um, I don't know, probably some kind of inspiring quote or, you know, some kind of, you know, you know, I, I can't think of a specific one, but you know, in the tube now in London, they have little whiteboards and it must be the, the, uh, the staff there put on little quotes, um, you know, just reflection quotes to help you kind of, you know, think about your day and uh or consider other people or whatever it is so it's something be be something along those lines i think i don't know i can't think of an exact quote but something that just gives people a little a little lift and helps them connect with other people a bit better okay okay so i want to go back and for some reason i'm I'm keen on knowing kind of a little bit more about my guests and 
I think it's really interesting when we talk, especially kind of you mentioned it with Nick and memory and experience and all what happens for that to be recalled. But I guess, can you remember the first time you was in trouble and what did you do? <laughs> yes, I can. Well, I remember one of the times I was in trouble and I was in trouble a fair bit. Um, actually, that's a lie. I was a complete goody goody. Don't believe, <laughs> don't believe me. Um, no, but one of the times was um, my mum... My mum was quite talkative, or I always thought she was quite talkative when I was a two-year-old. Um, I must have been about two or three because, as, as the story will reveal, so um, I was waiting on the bottom of the stairs in my house in Ivybridge, which is in Devon, uh, with my mate, Daniel Thompson, who I went to secondary school with a, a while back um, as well. And, uh, and my mum was chatting to our, our kind of childminder, Jane Denley. Shout out to Jane Denley. Um, and, uh, and they were, they were going on a bit too long. So I decided, me and Daniel decided that we were going to, going to walk to school. So off we went, it was probably about three miles away <clears throat> and we got about probably three quarters away up just as we were going up to the hill to the, to the nursery. And then for whatever reason, we decided it was probably a good idea to turn around and go back again. Um, and about hundred meters away from, uh, from the house. My dad came screaming past in his uh, in his Peugeot 205 or whatever it was, slamming on the brakes. It was like, where the bloody hell have you been? <laughs> and basically, they thought we'd been stolen out the front door by the, I don't know, an axe murderer. Um, <clears throat> and so um, my mum sort of collected us up and took us up to the nursery school. Um, and I remember I had to stand in front of stand in front of assembly, and as the teachers and my mum basically gave me a dressing down in front of the entire school and uh I kind of hid hid my head in between in between my mum's ankles um and and wailed but not, no one would stop giving me a dressing down so yeah that was one of my earliest memories of getting in trouble okay okay nice <laughs> <laughs> oh that's amazing I can actually picture you. I don't even know your dad but I can picture him fuming raging <laughs> yeah yeah, he was very, he was raging, but uh, yeah, different parenting techniques those days. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. <laughs> so, I guess we we have we have to kind of talk about learning to a certain point. Um, and I know we've already done that, but I kind of just want to take it more that way for now. So recently, you did the most recent pod, the most recent blog post I seen was about kind of learning design and and not as important as you think. Do you remember that one? I do, yeah, because I was asked about it in an interview for a learning design job. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. This is a, yeah, it's a problem where I'm where I'm on where I'm honest and provocative, and then people call me up on it. It can be tricky, but yes, I do remember that. I do remember that. So, I mean, let's just assume that our our listeners haven't um, haven't listened to it, haven't read it. Sorry, maybe you can give us a bit of a whistle stop tour and, and kind of what the key pullouts of it was and in fact maybe you can yeah maybe you could set the scene of the role what you went for and kind of why it why it provoked the blog post yeah it wasn't really that it was kind of the role i'm in now so um it's spongeparrot.com by the way if you want to read my blog um so uh so yes no the point the point of the article is very simple which is that um there was a client who we rolled out a program to, which involved far, six hours of um, of e-learning. And what what was interesting to me about that is I spent probably the last ten years talking about how traditional, conventional click-through e-learning is a waste of time and waste of money and all this kind of stuff. But it had an incredible impact on the bottom line and the KPIs of the business. Um, and and you kind of question it. And you question yourself and everything that you believe in when that happens, and you wonder why why that that came about. And the the re, the real reason for it in the end was because um, internally they had some extremely passionate, dedicated champions for the program, um, and and they basically drove it. They drove the change in the business that they wanted to see. And so what that realized what I realized from that process was that. Um, or that story is that actually learning design in many ways isn't that important in the sense that you can roll out a pile of wank as a learning design, but if you've got the buy-in, you've got the motivation, and you've got the champions within the organization, the business will change or or you'll, so you can still achieve your KPIs. 
So while <clears throat> I think while L&D spends a huge amount of time, or L&D professionals spend a huge amount of time designing and crafting amazing learning experiences, and some that are less, less good, um, actually, <clears throat> it's as much about crafting the relationships within the organization with the stakeholders, with the senior sponsors, and making sure it's, you know, everybody buys into it as much as it is um, about the actual, you know, experience that the end user or the learner goes through. So that was really the point of that blog, whether or not it came across as another question. <laughs> um, no, but yeah, I think it did. Learn. I think it did. And I found it, I found it personally really interesting because I think what we see in kind of in these corporate environments, and I say these as a bit of a bad thing, but I, I love corporate. I, I do. I enjoy it, especially when I'm in a, a, a good team. Um, but we kind of always overlook how the, cor- the corporate environment is this kind of organism. It, it's kind of this thing. It's this network. You know, years ago, we talk about data and how things were exchanged and how stories were told. You know, you can take it all the way back around where we're talking around a fire you know, back in the day and kind of this was how, how knowledge was transferred and how people heard about heard about stuff and and kind of but yet in this modern digital age or if you like, the first thing we do is we switch off the fact that actually the big it's like you say, the biggest the biggest driver will be the conversations what are had are being had and kind of actually like I say, having these champions, these learning heroes but having these having these people who can push promote and tell stories about it yeah yeah so it becomes marketing in a sense um influ- yeah you just call it influencer marketing if you were a marketeer but um yeah it's really about having the, the the people that can pull the cultural strings behind the project um and uh and that's yeah that's often what makes makes a difference you know what as good as as good as your learning design is, if you haven't got the right you know the right support in the business, and you might as well you might as well just you know chuck them a load of e learning modules, frankly, and just say fill your boots, fill your boots, yeah. So so what what I guess this is good, me being asking some provocative questions, I guess. Um, Go for it. What problem is it you're trying to you're trying to fix, or what is your challenge you're facing right now? In L and D, not in your personal life or anything like that. <laughs> Just yeah, in, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, I think it's an identity crisis. Actually, I think the, the the problem the problem I'm trying to fix is kind of what's the point of us as an industry, um, and I'm not convinced. I'm not convinced even you know. Uh, there are some great, great people in, in in the industry in which we work who are doing some interesting stuff. Um, but I think the vast majority of of stuff that the industry does is um, is probably a waste of time and money. So, no wonder we don't have a seat at the table, and no wonder that you know the finance team don't you know give us cash. <laughs> um, so yeah, I guess that's what what I'm trying to solve. And I, th- I think you know more. The, the question is whether you try and change change something from the inside or whether you spend spend the time and you know um so yeah um sorry my colleague's just leaving the office um it, yeah the question is whether you spend time trying to change something from the inside or whether you set up a little you know rebel alliance outside and try and do something completely different and new i think there are pros and cons to both approaches so um yeah i think that's what i'm i'm trying to do okay and maybe this is even more provocative but I'd like the word provocative. I'm probably not even using it in the right context, but um, L and D from a social presence. What's your take on that from a social media presence? Uh, so you're saying what is the what is the L and D social media presence? Yeah, like what, what's your take on the learning and development know. social media presence, and that can go across the board. Yeah. Yeah, so so um, I would say, well, basically, I think that social media is learning. So I don't think you know you you can bucket or or, or box up L and D into a particular thing. If you're talking about what L and D people post about L and D, that one, um, <laughs> then uh, then I would say that it's. Uh, I think a lot of social media is kind of one-upmanship. Um, it's basically sales, make people seem like they you know they know what they're talking about or they're thinking you know they're leading the way and things like that and i think there's a lot of that that goes on um 
I'm I'm concerned by the the kind of talking people videoing themselves talking about stuff because they've seen other people do it and don't have a huge amount else to say or any insights to share, but it's kind of the way things are done. So that slightly annoys me, but you know, respect if you if you feel like that's the way to get your, your message across, then go for it. Um and um I don't know. I, I I think if we had cool stuff to share, like really cool stuff to share, we would have stuff to share. But <laughs> but at the moment it just seems like the same arguments just kind of being batted back and forth or reframed. You know, you know, the term experience design, for example, I know you use it a lot, which is fine, but again, it it's kind of it's an evolution of basically an evolution of what people have been doing for a long time and um, we've just got better models of it now because there's people like punch drunk and actually commercially driven um experience design companies and agencies that do uh, you know that do secret cinema and all these kind of massive um amazing immersive uh, events so yeah i don't really feel like and is moving on a huge amount i think a lot of people are just nicking um or, or repackaging Nick Shackleton Joe's ideas anyway. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that's that's where we're at, really. Cool. Shout out to Punch Drunk. Um, I, yeah. I did, I did I tell you about their workshop? This is going to go out after I've been in it anyway, but I can edit this out. Um, did I tell you about that workshop, what I'm going on? No. Yes. You told me you were going on it, but you didn't tell me. Yeah, it's. Um, I think it's next week, actually. Oh, yeah. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, I, yeah, I've, well. I've got quite a lot of... Um, experienced designers on so you know the college of extraordinary experience and stuff like that um yeah. just because i think we not us me you but maybe yeah. maybe other people in the industry yeah. use experience design and they use it thinking it's something else and mm-hmm. that's kind of why why on this season i've got quite a lot of um actual experienced designers people who are doing it mm-hmm. just so that they can kind of share a light on on my it's probably my definition of what it is um but yeah i think yeah i think just kind of like just kind of adding to the point i made earlier about how design isn't that important if you don't have the buy-in and you don't have the the support from the organization all that kind of jazz i think the same applies to experience design in the sense that um it in a in a culture where or, or in a in a corporate where there are rules of engagement rule you know certain boundaries which are set by role models in the business or leaders or you know legacy culture i think it's very difficult to do anything that's you know that puts people outside of that that box and 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 changes the changes the paradigm or changes the environment um or you know changes the rules of the of, of engagement in the business so i think easily it's quite easy for experience design to start off to either be seen as faddy because it's not, it doesn't fit within the culture or be seen as um, or, or starts off as experience design and then it gets too chipped away to being something that's quite um, kind of conventional. So, yeah, I don't know. I really don't know if experience design in the way that we understand it is possible in, you know, in, in that kind of corporate world. I think what might actually be, be, be a, a, a better chance is actually creating experience design as separate events, which people from all sorts of different companies can come to rather than you kind of selling the idea to one to one business i don't know yeah so i completely agree i, I think experience design is great i think there's i think we spoke about this in past so i think there's challenges of scale going up and down within the industry like i've always worked from no budget to budget where i think a lot of a lot of people in experience design go well you need to give me lots and lots of budget to do this um so i think there's an argument around kind of cost and and actually how well can you make an experience without money um but i agree i think and this is probably where i was talking about the marketing kind of side of things you know i think if there's anything that's going to have an experience design aspect to it it's probably going to be experiential marketing right that's probably as close as you're going to get to it yeah so my my wife used to work at o2 and they did an award-winning experience basically it was called haunted house where they were using um smart technology uh to basically create a haunted house which people would go into and they'd be be scared and they were videoed and all this kind of stuff um but yeah they, that was a you know x million i don't know i don't know how much it was um but a lot of money um to do and you're not going to get that same kind of investment in um 
you know, in the L and D space, because actually there's, you know, people can't prove it's the you know, return on investment as well. So, um, so yeah, you, you, you get what you're given, don't you? And you end up, you know, with the budget that you have do it, trying your best with what you have, um, you know, respect that. I, d I also think there's a limitation unless you kind of fall onto a genius idea. I think having some budget, <laughs> um, will you know will if it's spent in the right way will make a difference yeah so spending money for example on actors rather than facilitators or yeah. um, <laughs> you know can make it can make a big difference rather than dave the cleaner so you know i mean shout out to xo2 david a days um so i mean yeah i think that's probably what i'll end up doing i think if i'm gonna go anywhere i'll probably end up going towards either kind of experiential marketing or more towards kind of this i enjoy i enjoy this human centered design approach i like ideo and stuff like that that's kind of where i enjoy fixing big problems um but i guess sorry we went off on tangent so let's let's do a couple more five rounds just because I'm, I'm mindful of your time charlie all right let's do it okay social media net positive or net negative um us. Now the answer is obviously neither. It's both, isn't it? Um, it's it's neither one or the other. I think uh, for me personally, um, yeah, for, for me personally, I think my my experience of it reflects many you know many of the generalizations of social media, which is that I can't I can't actually use Instagram because I I can almost feel myself to coming becoming depressed just looking at it for five minutes because it's just you know beautiful beach you know beautiful people doing beautiful things and i think you know why, why is my life so shit which runs obviously counter to what i was saying earlier about you know understanding that 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 life is is kind of lives on the inside um but i'm aware i'm kind of fully aware of that reaction and therefore i don't use it <clears throat> conversely my wife uses it constantly all the time and gets huge pleasure out of watching and seeing what other people are up to so in that way it's kind of horses for courses um I don't play the game much on LinkedIn stuff. I kind of post stuff and occasionally make comments on things, usually provocative comments, um, <laughs> because I like to see if people get pissed off or not. But also, I think it's good to challenge convention in, st in the status quo. Um, um, yeah, and Facebook, I get a lot of pleasure out of using Facebook because it keeps me connected to my friends. And, um, you know, although I have a fairly fluid, um, evolving friendship group, some of my good my, my best friends now i didn't know you know two years ago um i uh yeah i also value that interaction and hopefully um it will avoid me becoming a lonely old grumpy man which i'm kind of already <laughs> so <laughs> so that's uh so that yeah so i think the answer is it's it's kind of it's kind of n neither good or bad and i think people i think platforms are neither good or bad i think people um determine whether or not they are so okay okay um best festival you've ever been to uh, that's an easy one well actually it's not an easy one so um <clears throat> i i did one for my 30th birthday and then i did one for, for my wife's um 30th as well which are called neen fest which was a really catchy title nice. um yeah which was amazing because obviously you just invite all your mates and uh and have a great time but um <clears throat> the best festival is is the best festival in in the uk which isn't a you know my own festival is is shambhala um if you've never been then you are missing out uh it's the same weekend as leeds and reading and uh, i think it's leeds and reading and um and creamfields i think um and my 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 philosophy around or, or my idea around that is that most of the knobs go to those festivals and therefore there's less knobs that go to Shambhala. So <laughs> you get a really nice group of people, um, generally quite kind of, um, it might be on the hippie side for many people, but um, yeah, lots of very colorfully dressed people, you know, eating vegetarian food um, and raving until the early hours, early hours of the morning. So sounds awesome. Sounds awesome. Okay. Um, Three people who you recommend everybody should follow. In fact, let's let's change that question. Who's the three people you recommend people should follow in L and D? And this can be old people who you know everyone knows about. This can be new up and coming people, and or this could even be people not necessarily in the L and D field, but bring something to it. Oh God. Um... Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, uh, people are, I mean, I follow companies over people generally. So, um, in generally marketing companies. So, um, the drum is, is the kind of first premium marketing uh, magazine a publication. So, if you want to know what's going on in the world of marketing and experience and stuff like that, that's a good one. Um, my wife recommended one to me the other day, which I've been really enjoying, which is called Trend Watching. Um, so that's basically looking at new stuff and what's, you know, in various industries and fields. Um, and then I, yeah, again, I'd probably shout out and say, Nick, um, SJ is a great person to follow. He has new ideas around L and D. So, um, which is a very, relatively short supply. So those are the three things I would suggest. Okay. Next yeah. one. Nice, easy one. Obviously you as well, Danny. Oh, you smoother. And and obviously me. <laughs> obviously. Because I want to get, I've never, never been able to get over 400 followers on Twitter. So if you're listening, please just follow me just so I can have a day in the day in the glory <laughs> of 400 followers. It's to... always been up and down between like 360 and like 380, but I've never pushed over that barrier. So uh, I do say some interesting stuff sometimes. I believe you do, my friend. Okay, next <laughs> one. Next one. Um, do you even like yourself? Do I even like myself? Interesting. Um, I t I don't know. I tend to I tend to go on what other people say about me rather than what I believe about myself. So um, I think I think there are yeah. I mean there are good some good and bad things about me. I think there's some good and bad things about everybody. Um, I think good thing yeah. There's plenty of um, you know, things that I do and mindsets that I have, which I think are, are, are you know, are, are, are valuable and, and I, we need to retain. And there are some which I struggle, I'm aware of, but I struggle to shift. So, um, so sometimes, yeah, sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. It depends what sort of mood I'm in often. Okay. Okay. And maybe, yeah, let's do, let's do two more. So what five tips would you give to someone who is coming into our industry or our field other than don't do it? Um, read books. Okay. Um, uh, Alice conventional thinking. Um... basically seek out new knowledge every opportunity um surround yourself with good people and um probably something like uh focus on measurement something boring it always comes back to roi at the end of the day <laughs> sadly so i've just had a question from um from Gemma. Oh, yeah. And she said, um, if L&D today was a festival, which festival would it be and why? Or what festival should L&D aspire to be more like? I would say if it was a festival today, it would be learning tech. Because <laughs> <laughs> that's basically what it is, isn't it? Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, it's a dreadfully stilted and um, an old fashioned industry. I think people are aware of it. Um, they're struggling to break, to break away from it um, because they're all in it. And this is you know, what I talked about before around um, when you're in a place or industry for too long, you struggle to, to see it for what it is. And I think um, people really need to need to wake up and, Renew, remove some of those filters that we talked about um i think it needs to be more like a party i think people need to just accept that um you know that everyone's got everyone's got a view we're more or less playing in the same you know stirring the same pot and um and actually the only way we're going to evolve as an industry is to bring in a completely new perspective or, or bring in new people that can that challenge our thinking um i like to i like disruption and innovation so um, so yeah, that, I think that's we're we're in the learning tech space. I think Shambhala being my favourite festival would also be the place I'd like us to get to, where there's kind of an equality, um, there's a sustainability, 
there's a kind of um, a recognition of, um, you know, and there's a, there's a kind of connection and love between people at Shambhala that you don't get anywhere else that I've been to. So, um, so yeah, I think we need a bit more of that as well in L&D. Okay. Okay. So going kind of full circle now, I guess right at the start, I asked you to pick some numbers out for me. Yeah. These numbers um, tally up to a random list of items and it's just really simple. You're on a desert island um, and you find these five items. So your items end up being a condom, a spoon, a balloon, a metal spring and a keychain. What do you do with these items? So you say it again. Yep. So you've got a condom. Yep. A spoon. Yep. A balloon. Yep. A metal spring. Yeah. And a key ring. Hmm. I'd keep the condom spare in case I felt like I had enough and I wanted to asphyxiate myself. Okay. <laughs> so that'd be the first thing. Um the spoon I'd just keep as a as a utensil because you obviously need that to eat stuff. Um a balloon I could probably use to signal passing ships. Um was it does a balloon have helium in it? Um let's just say yeah. Okay, then yeah, I'd probably I'd probably think about ways of, of you know signaling passing ships. Um using my balloon. A spring. I wonder if I could use my spring. I could use the spring as some kind of weapon. Uh, it depends how big the spring was, but I wonder if I uncoiled the spring and stretched it out as some kind of really pointy, imp sharp implement. I could use it as like a spear fishing device, depending on how thick the spring was. So I'd probably tie it to a piece of wood and then use it to spear spearfish. Or actually, I could use it. I could cut it up into bits and use it as um, you know fish hooks. So that's what I do with the spring. And what was the last one? A key ring. Does it? What does it have on it? It's um, just the ring itself. Let's say it's a key ring with a fish on. A fish. Okay. Well, that's perfect because you can use that as a lure. You see, for your, you know, for your um, hook spring, spring hooks that you that I've made. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else I could use it. But it depends. If it was a shiny, a shiny key ring, I could probably also use it to signal passing ships while setting off my helium balloon as well. So. Oh, okay kind of double whammy hopefully someone would see see the uh the flashing sos signal from my key ring good thinking good thinking so i guess i guess right at the beginning i kind of asked you you know what you want to be when you grow up and charlie you know as much as anybody else that we constantly are, are constantly growing and developing so if i was to ask you the question now which was charlie what do you want to be when you grow up what would you say Ask me that question again, sorry. Yeah, so... My you... wife just texted me. <laughs> no, no, that's <laughs> fine, that's fine. So we are constantly developing, yeah? We never ever really truly grow, like, grow up. So if I was yeah. to ask you the question, Charlie, what do you want to be when you grow up? What would you say now? Hmm... I don't know. I think I don't really have a um a strong a strong pull into anything right now. Um I guess I just wanna work with fun, cool people with good ideas. Um I don't really care what industry and uh and make and or do some cool stuff. Um I also, th I also, I'm starting to become drawn to the idea of doing something kind of in the third sector. So I think um, I have a slight issue with, you know, taking taking a decent salary from a from a charity in a sense that you know people's donations are, are paying for it. But at the same time, I would like to to work in, you know, in a in an industry that's purely there for for the benefit of of others or you know life on this planet. So um, <clears throat> so I probably I probably want to work in, you know, ideally in like a, um, a, a an eco animal type charity, um, or maybe work in renewables or something like that. So something that's going to benefit people. I think I want to I want to do. 
Okay, cool. Well, Chad, I mean, wh- where can people find a little bit more about you and, and how can we follow you? Not in the starker way. Well, luckily, my name is awful to spell and um, and therefore I'm pretty much the only one. So my Twitter is at Charlie Neen, which is like knee on, on, your, on your leg with an extra N on the end. Um, and uh, my LinkedIn is my LinkedIn. So just search Charlie Neen. Um, my blog is spongeparrot.com. Uh, and uh you could try and connect me on facebook and i'll probably just ignore it but you can try okay i've got one extra question sponge parrot where did this come from yeah so uh where did it come from so i have a a special skill which is to soak up ideas and believe them and uh and kind of basically um adopt and believe in ideas that i'm told so it's the strength and weakness in that i believe everything i'm told but also it's a power in terms of i'm actually quite a good salesman because i start to believe the bullshit that i sprout um <clears throat> so that yeah that's where the sponge comes from and the power is basically me it's kind of a, uh, it's kind of a nod to the fact that actually i'm just basically regurgitating ideas that other people have thought of um a lot of the time um so I, yeah i'm not a I don't believe in my and many of the ideas are original that I come up with, and I believe that I I have to kind of nod to the the people before me that have come up with them. So um, that's where Sponge Parrot comes from. Um, awesome. So yeah. All right, Chad. Well, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks very much for uh, coming on. No pleasure, and I think it's a really um, a really honourable thing you're doing, and hopefully uh, people enjoy the, the podcast, even if you've got prats like me on them so yeah good work cheers charlie thanks bye bye take care bye